This is an audio course. Thank you for listening. This is a Proteo audio production, engaging story style scenario learning in audio. No need to watch, just listen. Some new concerns this morning about a potential conflict of interest involving the Leticia Perez conflict of interest case continued to unfold before a local judge today. I'm told that this is a horrible conflict of interest. You're a Harvard researcher. You supposedly just want to get the information. Canada's ethics commissioner has found the prime minister violated the Conflict of Interest Act and that he did seek to improve. Conflicts of interest make headlines and professions are under greater scrutiny than ever before when a conflict is suspected. And in many situations, the concern is absolutely valid. But let's be blunt about it. Conflicts of interest happen. And sometimes that's okay. Does that sound odd to you? Stick with us and we'll explain to you why conflicts of interest aren't always the evil beasts that they're made out to be. Hi, I'm Brian Friedrich. And I'm Laura Friedrich. And this is Conflicts of Interest, Unpacked. Okay, so let's start with a question. When you hear that a public official or a board member is in a conflict of interest, what words come to mind immediately to describe that person? Think about that for just a second. Are you thinking corrupt, greedy, immoral? Those are typically some of the words that might come to mind. And don't get us wrong here. Sometimes those words are perfect descriptors for the situation. But that's not always the case. Let's back up for a minute and think about where the problem arises. Is it the conflict of interest that's the issue? Or is the issue that the conflict wasn't dealt with appropriately? Or that the person in the conflict specifically orchestrated the conflict and used a situation to their advantage? Those are generally where the real issues lie. Conflicts of interest do not necessarily suggest corrupt intentions, but we've been conditioned to hear the words conflict of interest and immediately think that something unethical and perhaps illegal has happened. But that's not always the case. The conflict of interest itself is actually not necessarily a bad thing per se. Where the problems come up depend on how the conflict happened and what is done to address the conflict and deal with it appropriately. Okay, so let's run through the outline for this course. Now that we've reframed conflicts as not always evil, we'll get back to basics and start by defining what conflicts of interest are and the different types that can arise. Then we'll look at some of the key legal requirements that are commonly included in laws and regulations, as well as looking at how conflicts of interest are addressed in the ethics standards for professions. And then once we've got a solid grounding of the legal and ethical requirements, we'll talk through a framework for dealing with conflicts of interest appropriately to make sure that the best outcomes result. So what is a conflict of interest? In order for a conflict of interest to exist, they're quite simply need to be interests that are conflicting. And normally, how that manifests itself is that an individual's self-interest is in conflict with, or is competing with, a contractual or a fiduciary duty that they owe to another party, whether that's a client, an organization, their employer, or some other entity. Here are a few examples. Engineers have a duty to ensure public safety. But what if an engineer working for the government also consults to private companies? And she just learned that one of her client companies that has a marginal safety record is going to bid on a government construction contract. Real estate agents have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of their client. But what if the agent owns a property and is selling it, and he thinks that the property would be a perfect fit for one of his clients who's in the market? Professional accountants performing audits are required to be independent of the organizations they audit. But what if the auditor's sister-in-law was just hired as the CFO of one of the firm's audit clients? Academic researchers have an obligation to objectively seek the truth and present unbiased findings to the public. But what if a researcher's project is funded by a special interest group that is hoping for a certain result to support their position? In each of these cases, the person's own self-interest could motivate them to take an action that would be to the detriment of their employer, their client, or to the public. And when we're talking about self-interest, 
the most common situation is where there's a financial interest, where there's money at stake. But it doesn't have to directly be money. It could be some other type of benefit, perhaps recognition or opportunity for a family member or something else. There are a few other common examples that raise conflicts of interest that we'll introduce here. The first is when we have access to confidential information that we could use for our own personal advantage. Our personal interests, then, could influence us to act on that information, but our professional duty is obviously to refrain from doing so. The second example is one where a vendor offers a gift or extends hospitality, and they're trying to influence us to act in a certain way, usually to win business. Gifts and hospitality are a risky area because even if we don't think we're being influenced, we might actually be, and others would certainly question our ability to be objective. And another example is where we have an opportunity to get an inappropriate benefit because of our position. For example, if my team is required to travel as part of the job, and I'm the one allocating travel budget, I'd have the opportunity to assign myself to all of the interesting foreign trips and assign other team members to the less desirable destinations. And let's be clear. In each of these examples, we're not saying that the person in a conflict of interest has done or would do anything inappropriate. We're just saying that that's what their self-interest could motivate them to do. We need to understand the distinction between the conflict of interest itself, how it arises, and ultimately the action or decision that's taken to resolve it. And it's a message we'll be repeating regularly throughout the course because the term conflict of interest is frequently used quite loosely without proper evaluation. To illustrate the distinction between the conflict of interest and the action, we're going to turn to an expert that you might have heard of. His name is Richard Painter, a U.S. law professor who served as the chief White House ethics lawyer under President George W. Bush from 2005 through 2007. Although he was a Republican at that time, he later ran for the Senate as a Democrat, and ultimately he describes himself as a moderate or a centrist. Note that we're not at all concerning ourselves with the political affiliations of folks in this course. We just want to provide context for his commentary. Professor Painter spoke to students at Dartmouth College about conflicts of interest specifically with respect to the legal safeguards in the U.S. Constitution and statutes. And he mentioned that during the Bush administration, it was his job to explain the requirements of the conflict of interest statute to individuals that were being considered for high-powered government roles. Here's an example of the type of problem I would deal with. The chairman of Goldman Sachs come to my office, uh, Henry Paulson, uh, he was being considered for the Treasury Secretary uh, back in 2006, and I had to discuss with him uh, the conflicts of interest that could arise from his holding lots of stock in Goldman Sachs. And he already knew that he would probably have to sell the stock in Goldman Sachs in order to become Treasury Secretary. Uh, why? Because there's a criminal conflict of interest statute that says if you participate in any uh, government matter that has a direct and predictable effect on your financial interests, or those of a company in which you own stock, uh, that's a crime. You could go to jail for that. A student asked Painter how he would manage to convince a candidate to divest themselves of such interests. Listen to his description of how discussions would play out. What I'd start with is the statute, the conflict of interest provision, is a criminal statute. So you commit a crime if you do anything in the government that has a direct and predictable effect on your financial interests or of a company that you own uh, stock in. So you could keep your Goldman Sachs stock and go to the Treasury Department, but the minute you do anything, participate personally and substantially in a government decision, any government matter at the Treasury Department that has a direct and predictable effect on Goldman Sachs, you've committed a felony. Woo, that's serious. And they say, I just didn't sell the Goldman Sachs stock. So the key is start with what they absolutely have to do when you start with a criminal statute. Because uh, you know, these guys generally don't want to go to jail. So from Professor Painter's example, you should be able to separate out the conflict of interest from the problematic action or decision. The conflict of interest arises from being a major shareholder in a huge investment bank like Goldman Sachs, 
while also serving as U.S. Treasury Secretary, where you're responsible for domestic and international financial, economic, and tax policy. The conflict of interest itself isn't what causes the harm. As Painter said, you could keep your stock. The harm doesn't come from the conflict itself. The harm comes if you do anything in your government position that has a direct and predictable effect on your financial interests or on the financial interests of the investment bank that you own stock in. That's the part that's unethical and in this case also illegal. And so the reason why the stocks would be sold is because the risk is high that many actions that the Treasury Secretary undertakes could have a direct and predictable impact on Goldman Sachs. In other words, in some situations, the potential for inappropriate decisions to be made, or the perception that the person can't possibly set aside their own interests and make decisions in the best interest of the public, that risk and perception is so strong that the only workable course of action is to eliminate the conflict of interest by either not taking the job or by divesting of the interest before taking the job. A lot of conflict of interest examples stem from the fact that one or more people have the power to make decisions that impact others, but those decision makers have a personal financial interest that threatens to sway their judgment. As I said earlier, it's not always about the money. Sometimes it's some other benefit at stake. But often, financial interests are the root of the issue. And in some cases, the outcome can be severe. When we think about how important it is to get this stuff right, it's useful to remember the extreme cases and what can be at stake. Professor Painter provides a sobering example that we'll close out this part with. He's talking to the Dartmouth students about Presidents Washington and Jefferson, both historically well-respected presidents, but he's talking about the fact that they both ran plantations and they were allowed to keep those plantations because the U.S. Founding Fathers exempted the president from the conflict of interest statutes. And he alludes to how the ownership of those plantations may have influenced their views, with devastating results. Presidents Washington and Jefferson in particular uh, would visit their plantations when they were not on the job. Uh, and uh, these plantations were very successful businesses. Those businesses were serious financial conflicts of interest. Because when you look at the business model, Slave labor, massive amounts of slave labor used in those plantations. They were owned by a first president or a third president and several other presidents. Many members of the United States Senate and members of the United States House of Representatives. Many of the founders at the time of the drafting of the Constitution had enormous financial conflicts of interest with respect to their businesses. And this was the most tragic financial conflict of interest in American history. I mean, it was a large part of people not being willing to deal with slavery at the outset uh, in the drafting of the Constitution. There were other reasons as well, but financial conflicts of interest have consequences. Financial conflicts of interest have consequences. Indeed, they have. We'll look at more types of conflicts of interest in the next module. Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest Unpacked. In the last module, we introduced the main concepts of conflict of interest and looked specifically at how actual or real conflicts of interest come about. An actual or real conflict of interest is where a professional's self-interest could in fact motivate them to act in a way that goes against their client's or employer's interest or the public interest and the person actually does have the opportunity to take that action or make that decision. <laughs>
Note that they haven't yet made that decision either way, just that the opportunity is there and that the individual has the power to decide or influence the outcome. In the last module, we focused on examples where the conflict arises because someone's self-interest is competing with their duty to act in another person's interest. So, for example, where there's a conflict between a professional's personal interest and a client's interest or the public's interest. But there's another situation that sometimes comes up, and that's where a professional owes a duty to two different individuals or organizations, and the interests of those two individuals or organizations are in conflict. So that would be the situation, for example, if a real estate agent were to try to represent both the buyer and the seller in a single property transaction. Pat Pointer, a lawyer with the Real Estate Council of British Columbia, explains how this concern led to changes in the regulation of real estate agents in one Canadian province. In 2016, an independent advisory group looked at ways to improve the practice and regulation of real estate in BC. One of the key changes the group recommended had to do with how real estate professionals should manage conflicts of interest between clients. The group was concerned that when real estate professionals represented clients with conflicting interest in the same transaction, like a buyer and a seller, or two potential buyers, there were greater risks for those consumers. The group recommended that real estate professionals in BC should not represent more than one client in a transaction, so the clients would always receive the undivided loyalty of their real estate professional. Based on this recommendation, BC's superintendent of real estate made a rule banning dual agency except in very rare circumstances. Conflicting interests between two clients is a risk for other professions as well. For example, what if a lawyer or an accountant is engaged by a married couple to do tax planning work for them, but the couple then decides to divorce? In these kinds of situations, it's difficult, or maybe even impossible, to adequately serve the interests of both parties if you're advising them or representing them in negotiations. In some professions, if you end up in this situation, you'd be expected to step back from representing both clients and to turn each of them over to a new representative. In other professions, you may be able to keep working with one of the parties and release the other if both parties consent to that arrangement. An example of a professional trying to serve two clients with conflicting interests was the case of Canadian National Railway, or CN Rail, versus McCursher LLP, a law firm. In this case, McCursher had been representing CN Rail on a variety of corporate matters, but at the same time, the firm also accepted a retainer to act against CN in what was apparently a lucrative class action lawsuit, without getting CN's consent. CN filed to have the firm removed from acting as counsel in the class action suit and said that the firm had breached its duty of loyalty to CN by placing itself in that conflict of interest. The case ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, which upheld the general rule that, and I quote from the 2013 Supreme Court judgment, a law firm cannot act for a client whose interests are adverse to those of another existing client unless both clients consent. In other words, in simpler terms, the court reiterated that lawyers can't act both for and against a client. And there's another kind of conflict of interest that we need to think about. So remember that an actual or real conflict of interest is where the individual's self-interest could in fact motivate them to act in a way that goes against their clients or employer's interests or the public interest, and the person actually does have the opportunity and authority to make that decision. But in addition to real conflicts, we need to think about perceived conflicts of interest, which are sometimes also called apparent conflicts. Perceived or apparent conflicts are ones where, although there's no actual conflict, a reasonable observer might nonetheless think that there is one. So in other words, for example, consider a situation where a professional's self-interest would not motivate them in a way that would go against their client's interests or their employer's or the public interest. But someone looking at the situation might reasonably think that it would. Perceived conflicts can also arise in situations where a professional doesn't actually have the authority or opportunity to make a particular decision that would benefit themselves, but an observer doesn't know that and might reasonably think that the professional does have control over the decision that would allow them to benefit. 
So between real and perceived conflicts of interest, which type do you think is more problematic? The majority of people would likely say that the real conflict is the more problematic, and their reasoning is that real conflicts are the ones where actual damage would occur and where the person in the conflict of interest can get themselves into serious trouble. And it's true that real conflicts can lead to real damage, but there's an argument to be made that perceived conflicts of interest can actually be just as problematic, if not more so. The rationale behind this point of view is that with real conflicts of interest, they're usually pretty obvious to us, so we can address them appropriately. But perceived conflicts can be much harder to identify objectively and can seriously damage an organization's or an individual's reputation and the level of trust that they are given by others. Not identifying or addressing the perceptions of other stakeholders can cause major problems without us even being aware of them. And this means that we need to recognize perceived conflicts of interest as a particular threat and ensure that we stay on top of them as well. Another way to think of this idea is that the existence of a conflict of interest leads to suspicion. And that suspicion is there regardless of whether the conflict of interest is real or perceived. And it's also there whether the professional's judgment is actually negatively impacted by the situation or not. To use a metaphor from an engineering context, let's listen to Michael Louie, who was a notable engineer and academic, and he was the editor of the Journal of Engineering Education from 2012 to 2017. He explains this idea using a quote from one of his colleagues. Michael Davis at the Illinois Institute of Technology compares conflict of interest to uh, dirt in a gauge. It doesn't mean that the uh, reading of the gauge will be wrong, but simply that because of the dirt, we can't rely on the reading that the gauge is giving. Similarly, uh, because you have these financial or family interests, it doesn't mean that your engineering judgment will be wrong, but simply that people will not be able to rely on it, that your judgment will not be trustworthy. And trust is the cornerstone of all professional relationships. So that's why even the appearance of a conflict of interest also causes a loss of trust. Even the appearance of a conflict of interest causes a loss of trust. That statement really sums up the reason why we need to be just as concerned about perceived conflicts as real ones and address them appropriately. Let's use another example to drive this home. Consider the story of Boeing 737 MAX airplane. You'll recall that that was the aircraft that had two deadly crashes. One was Lion Air in October of 2018, and the other one was Ethiopian Airlines in March of 2019. The crashes were linked to the flight control system called the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. And although at the time of this recording, the final cause hasn't yet been reported by investigators, there were reports expressing concerns that the MCAS system had malfunctioned, causing the plane to dive uncontrollably. Questions were reasonably raised as to whether Boeing knew about the safety risk, and if so, when they knew. And the questions got louder in October of 2019 when reports emerged that an employee had texted concerns about the system to a colleague a couple of years before. Here's Fox News reporting on a New York Times story. Two years ago, a pilot was instant messaging to somebody else at Boeing about how the safety system, this MCAS, was a disaster and was extremely hard to control back then. This is from a chief technical pilot who was simulating this MCAS so-called safety system. And, and for our viewers who don't know, it was a sensor system. And if it senses that the plane is going into, uh, if it, it senses there's a problem that the plane is stalling, it pushes the nose down. Um, but if it misreads that, which apparently it did in both cases of the deadly crashes, that becomes a huge problem. And the pilot said, it's running rampant in the sim, meaning the simulator, Granted, I suck at flying, but even this was egregious. Again, the New York Times. Uh, the underlying question being asked of the airplane manufacturer is, of course, one of conflict of interest. Did Boeing put its own interests of profit ahead of the public safety? New stories like this one certainly make it sound that way, but as is often the case, there's more to the story. If you read the full transcripts of the text messages, 
there's more context to be had. The comments were made in the middle of what seemed to be a casual bantering conversation between two test pilots, with some details of the employee's days being thrown in along the way. The message about the system being out of control actually said, it's running rampant in the sim on me. At least that's what Vince thinks is happening. And the other test pilot says, oh great, that means we have to update the speed trim description in Vol 2. So in fuller context, it's certainly plausible that the two pilots were raising a serious issue, but perhaps one that was part of the normal pre-launch testing and programming process to resolve system issues, rather than on the final MCAS system itself. The context is at least something to consider, together with all the other evidence, of course. But the argument that Boeing officials had put their own interests ahead of the public safety was, in fact, the argument that had been made by shareholders in April of 2019 as they launched a lawsuit. Reuters reported it as follows. Boeing Co.'s legal troubles grew on Tuesday as a new lawsuit accused the company of defrauding shareholders by concealing safety deficiencies in its 737 MAX planes before two fatal crashes led to the worldwide grounding. According to the complaint, Boeing effectively put profitability and growth ahead of airplane safety and honesty by rushing the 737 MAX to market to compete with Airbus SE while leaving out extra or optional features designed to prevent the Ethiopian Airlines and Lion Air crashes. It also said Boeing's statements about its growth prospects and the 737 MAX were undermined by its alleged conflict of interest from obtaining broad authority from federal regulators to assess the plane's safety. What's particularly interesting about this story is that shareholders sued the company for putting profitability and growth first. We don't often see that. No, only when things go disastrously wrong. So there are two different instances of conflict of interest that play into this story. The first is that Boeing had the authority from a regulator to judge its own plane safety. The background to this is that the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration that oversees Boeing, the FAA, they had a staff of 45 people at the time. But there was a program in place whereby a team of 1,500 Boeing employees was given authority by the FAA to handle key certification work on the company's aircraft. This means that the Boeing employees making the decisions on certification would have a duty to ensure that the aircraft was safe before it was allowed to fly. But at the same time, as Boeing employees, it would be in their own best interest to get the plane in the air and making money for the company as quickly as possible. The second conflict of interest relates to whether senior Boeing staff knew that there were safety issues before one or both of the crashes and were put in a position of deciding whether to report the issue and risk having the planes grounded. Now, are those conflicts of interest real or perceived? What do you think? Well, we don't have all of the details here, but there's an argument that if Boeing was given broad authority to assess their own aircraft safety, then that could be seen as a real conflict of interest. Making safety decisions would require a great deal of judgment, and there would likely be either implicit or explicit pressure on Boeing employees to get out ahead of the competition and have the new 737 MAX producing revenue. What's open to much more debate is whether there were sufficient safeguards in place to mitigate this threat to objectivity, such as regulatory oversight and internal quality systems. But the second part of that, the thought that management may have known about flaws and been motivated to conceal them, that one is even harder to determine whether there's a real conflict. We don't know, for example, who knew what and when and the extent of financial motivation or other incentives there may have been at stake if people did suspect a problem. So it's harder to tell if that conflict was real or perceived. But ultimately, that doesn't matter. There's been a huge cost to society in terms of lives that were lost, and the public's trust in the company has been significantly marred for the long term. Now, hopefully, most of the decisions that we're each making as professionals aren't life and death, but they're clearly still important. And that means that we do need to make sure that we're taking the risk seriously that a conflict of interest may impair our judgment. And we also need to recognize 
that even the perception of a conflict without disclosure and taking some form of action can have serious reputational impacts. Okay, so that's the rundown of some of the ways that professionals are typically faced with real or perceived conflicts of interest. We'll stop for a break here, and when we come back in the next module, we'll look more closely at the specific legal and ethical obligations surrounding conflicts of interest. Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest Unpacked. Let's look now at the legal and ethical obligations that professionals generally have with respect to conflicts of interest. And let's say right up front that specific laws and ethics requirements will differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as well as vary across professions. So in this module, we're going to be speaking in general terms about the types of laws, regulations, and ethics code requirements that are typical. And we'll give you some guidance on where to find specific obligations that you have, but we won't be examining the requirements of any specific jurisdiction or profession in depth. So an interesting foundational question when talking about conflicts of interest is, whose interests do we care about? And to answer that question, we need to ask, well, who do I owe a duty to? Who we owe duties to depends on our profession and our role. Sometimes the duty is derived by a specific contract that we've entered into, which might also create a fiduciary duty. Other times, duties might result from more general requirements or even simply from stakeholder expectations. So let's look at these in a bit more depth. The first way we'll explore is that we might have a duty to a person or organization through a contract. With respect to contractual obligations, Contracts that put the professional in the role of a trusted agent normally results in the professional having a fiduciary duty to the person or the organization that has engaged or retained them. This requires an extremely high standard of care and requires the fiduciary to act in the interest of the principal rather than in the professional's own interest. Another common contract that can place duties on us is our employment contract. These contracts typically spell out obligations to act on behalf of, and in the interest of, the organization that we work for. So, for example, an employee would land themselves in a clear conflict of interest if they were to set up a competing business as a sideline to their job, where they'd have an opportunity to steer clients away from their employer and toward their own business. So, contracts of various types are one source that can bind us to an obligation. And another way that we're bound by duty is through laws and regulations. A good example of this is serving on a board of directors. In many jurisdictions, board members are obligated by law to act in the best interest of the organization they serve. Typically, these obligations would be in the national or provincial or state business corporations act, corporate codes, companies act, societies act, or whatever the country specific pieces of legislation are called. Sometimes they'll be included in separate governance law that may also be part of the jurisdiction's securities legislation. So, for example, there are governance requirements under Sarbanes-Oxley and under the EU directives. Another example of obligations derived by law comes in where the enabling legislation of a profession places obligations on that profession. And often the way it works is that the law will actually put obligations not on the individual members of a profession, but rather on the professional body. So, for example, in the legislation that creates a profession such as lawyers or engineers or accountants, the law itself will often place requirements on the professional body to act in the public interest. And then what usually happens is that through the professional organization, it will impose that obligation on its members through professional codes of conduct, including rules around conflicts of interest, serves the public interest by protecting the public against self-interested acts by professionals. And these rules also help to protect the reputation and in turn the value of the profession. So then that bridges us into the third way that these duties to particular people or entities come about for professionals. And that's through codes of ethics or codes of conduct. Most professional codes will stipulate requirements for the members of the profession 
with respect to who they owe a duty to. And most codes will spell out a duty to clients and maybe to employers, depending on the context. But most professional codes also lay out obligations to protect the public interest and to specifically put the public interest ahead of personal interest. That's really one of the fundamental aspects of being recognized as a profession by the public. Even without a regulatory mandate that says so, the public will expect that anyone they call a professional will be looking out for the public and not just working to further their own interests. But let's be clear here that when we talk about putting someone else's interest ahead of our own, we're talking about their legitimate interests. This doesn't mean in any way that we should be supporting our clients or employers if they're attempting to do something illegal or unethical. In other words, the duty that we owe is one of loyalty, but not blind subservience. This aligns with the overall duty of professionals to be supporting the public interest. It's clearly not in the public interest if an employer or a client is acting inappropriately and we help them to do that. So then laws and professional codes spell out who we owe a duty to in terms of putting their interests ahead of our own. And then going further, laws, regulations, and codes of conduct also typically spell out some specific obligations related to conflicts of interest. For example, many jurisdictions have laws that require avoiding and disclosing conflicts. For example, when serving as a director on a board or service in public office. Keep in mind, though, that modern statutes tend not to totally prohibit directors from having business dealings with the organizations that they serve on, because lawmakers recognize that outright prohibitions would make it more difficult for organizations to attract individuals with the knowledge and expertise that they need. There are also laws that make it illegal for public office holders to put their own interests ahead of the public's, much like those that Professor Painter was describing for us earlier in the course, with respect to the U.S. statute. Laws typically focus on real conflicts of interest because they can be objectively proven. But when determining whether a conflict exists, the common consideration, remember, is to ask what a reasonable person would conclude. Another common area is laws that prohibit bribery and corruption. The Criminal Code and the Corruption of Foreign Public Officials Act in Canada, for example, or the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The underlying risk here is that if someone is in a position of power and they were to make a decision that impacts others, but they're also allowed to have a personal stake, they'll be tempted to put their own interest first. So many laws deal with conflict of interest issues directly, but there are also laws that indirectly promote proper avoidance and management of conflicts of interest, such as requirements in some securities legislation for there to be a majority of independent directors on public company boards, which recognizes that independent directors, in other words, directors who are at arm's length to the organization, independent directors are a good safeguard against the risk that the inside directors might be influenced by an inherent conflict of interest created by their dual role of being employees while also being tasked with overseeing the organization. A fairly recent example of a public official being found offside of conflict of interest laws is the case of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the corporation SNC-Lavalin. What happened over the past year shouldn't have happened. Uh, I take responsibility for it. It's a bombshell report that could reshape the fall federal election. Canada's ethics watchdog... In case you're not a follower of Canadian news... The gist of the story was that SNC-Lavalin, which is a large Montreal-based engineering company, SNC-Lavalin wanted to negotiate a remediation agreement in order to avoid a criminal prosecution on bribery and fraud charges that were related to foreign contracts. Canada's Director of Public Prosecutions decided not to allow that negotiation, and Prime Minister Trudeau tried to convince the Attorney General to intervene. Dion writes, the Prime Minister directly and through his senior officials use various means to exert influence over Miss Wilson-Raybould. Dion goes on to say that SNC-Lavalin would have benefited financially had Wilson-Raybould given in to the pressure applied by Trudeau. The Conflict of Interest Act in Canadian federal law states that no public office holder shall use his or her position as a public office holder to seek to influence a decision of another person so as to further the public office holder's 
private interests or those of the public office holder's relatives or friends or to improperly further another person's private interests. That last part is the phrase that matters. A public office holder can't influence someone else's decision to, quote, improperly further another person's private interests. Canada's Ethics Commissioner found that Trudeau had violated that section of the Act because, in his opinion, SNC-Lavalin would have improperly benefited from avoiding prosecution. Note that a company is considered a person for the purposes of the law. Critics said that Trudeau was pressuring the Attorney General out of a desire to pander for his supporters, whereas Trudeau had long held that he was just trying to save Canadian jobs in this large organization and to avoid negative economic repercussions for the country. Ultimately, Prime Minister Trudeau took responsibility for his actions, but still disagreed with some aspects of the Ethics Commissioner's findings. So that's an example of conflict of interest laws and how they can be interpreted. But now let's consider professional codes of conduct. Most professional codes specifically address conflicts of interest, and generally they'll require professionals to avoid conflicts where they can, and if they don't manage to avoid them, the professional is required to take appropriate actions to either eliminate or mitigate them down to an acceptable level. The specific form taken for the requirements will depend on how detailed a particular code is and whether the profession's code is more principles-based or more rules-based. To get more insight on how professional codes of conduct address conflicts of interest, we spoke with Deanne Jules, who is the Deputy Director of the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants, or the IESBA. For background, the IESBA is an independent standard-setting board that develops high-quality ethics standards and other pronouncements for professional accountants worldwide, and they're focused on the public interest. The board's standards are contained within the International Code of Ethics for Professional Accountants. It's a very principles-based code, and we asked Deanne how the IESBA code deals with the concept of conflict of interest at both the principles level and at the requirements level. The IESBA code sets out a number of principles required for all professional accountants to apply, and one of those is the fundamental principle of objectivity. And that's where the concept of conflict of interest is perhaps most directly dealt with. With respect to objectivity, professional accountants shouldn't allow their judgment to be biased by conflict of interest or any potential influences. We also have the concept of independence in the IESBA code which is very closely linked to objectivity, and it requires professional accountants who perform engagements where they need to be independent to be free from any influence because of conflicts of interest. While the concept of independence is not a fundamental principle, it is required for professional accountants who audit financial statements or perform other assurance engagements. Now, there are also some more specific requirements in the code with respect to the conflict of interest, both for professional accountants in business, as well as professional accountants in public practice. In both of these instances, the code is very clear that a professional accountant shall not allow a conflict of interest to compromise any professional or business judgments. So the IESBA code deals with conflicts of interest quite extensively. And as we've mentioned elsewhere in the course, when we're evaluating conflicts of interest, the perceptions of other people is an important consideration. With the IESBA code, there's a requirement to apply what's called the reasonable and informed third-party test, not unlike other types of laws and regulations. Deanne gave us the following guidance on how this kind of test helps professionals make appropriate judgments in conflict of interest situations. The reasonable informed third-party test is a required element that's necessary when applying the conceptual framework. The conceptual framework is essentially the approach set out in the code to identify, evaluate, and address threats that might be created to the fundamental principle, including the fundamental principle of objectivity. And when a professional accountant is in a real or apparent conflict of interest situation, staying objective is quite difficult. So having a logical, systematic approach that they could follow really provides a guide 
to help them consider all the different facts and circumstances and understand those facts and circumstances in considering the appropriate factors and really focus on the perspectives of others rather than looking at the issue from their own individual perspective. What Deanne talked about in terms of the IESBA Code of Ethics is typical of many professional codes and also highlights the importance of paying attention to the principles that are either directly in or underlying an ethics code and not just the rules. And one thing worth emphasizing is that in professional codes, we often see guidance to professionals as to the importance of considering whether a reasonable and informed third party, or words to that effect, whether that kind of person would think that a conflict of interest exists. So based on both legal requirements and professional requirements, we should always be careful to consider how an objective third party would interpret the situation that we're evaluating. We need to ensure that we don't allow our own biases to get in the way of identifying both real and perceived conflicts. We need to step back and take a a broader, more objective view, or be able to confidentially speak with someone who can. Okay, so that's a look at how conflict of interest considerations show up in laws, regulations, and professional codes of conduct. In the final two modules of this course, we'll go through a framework for avoiding, identifying, and addressing conflicts of interest, as well as some ideas of how to promote compliance in your organization. In everyday life, there are conflicts of interest that arise, and it's always great to have a framework that kind of just guides the way you think about it in a very objective, logical way, having regard to what other people might think about it. Because as humans, you know, we have our own biases, and you think you have the right intent, but when you put yourself in someone else's shoes, that's when you realize, oh, what would someone else think? And that's when you realize what the real conflict might be. Welcome back. That was Deanne Jules, the Deputy Director of the IESBA. In this module and the next, we're going to go through a framework of how to address conflicts of interest and then walk through an example to illustrate the process. So the basic general steps are avoid conflict of interest where possible, recognize a conflict when it arises, Evaluate the conflict to see how severe it is. Determine whether the conflict needs to be eliminated or should be mitigated. And then take action to eliminate the conflict if necessary, or put safeguards in place to effectively mitigate the threats caused by the conflict and monitor effectiveness of the mitigation plan. The first line of defense when it comes to conflicts of interest is to be able to avoid them whenever possible. To do this, it's worth thinking in advance about the roles that you have and the duties and obligations that go along with them. Think about who you owe a duty to to protect their interests and what types of decisions might challenge your ability to objectively fulfill that role. Another important way to avoid being tripped up is to make sure that you understand your professional obligations that have been codified in your jurisdiction. For example, there's going to be some roles or activities where the government or your professional body has already decided that a particular action would create too much risk and that the resulting conflict of interest can't be mitigated. As an example, a jurisdiction's auditing standards and or ethics standards require auditors to maintain independence from the organizations they audit. So a professional accountant wouldn't be allowed to audit a client if they have a material financial interest in that client. As another example, real estate licensees in some jurisdictions are prohibited from double-ending a deal, meaning that they can't represent both the buyer and the seller on the same transaction. Along with understanding your obligations under laws and codes of conduct, 
It's also important to know the requirements that are stipulated in your company's conflict of interest policies and procedures, as well as any policies that they may have with respect to areas such as gifts and hospitality. Understanding the various requirements that apply to you is obviously an essential precursor to being able to identify any potential conflicts. And what about if you're the one responsible for setting up policies and procedures and ensuring compliance with legal and professional requirements in your organization? If this is your role, be aware of the importance of the overall ethics culture of your organization. Focusing on ensuring that the board, management, and staff all recognize the benefits of disclosure and that they realize that not all conflicts are bad. This suggests that championing openness and education about conflicts of interest within your organization is paramount. For more advice in this area, we'll call on Michael Volkov of Volkov Law Group. He's a lawyer who works primarily in the area of ethics and compliance, and his firm provides terrific resources for compliance officers and anyone else who finds themselves responsible for their organization's ethics and compliance initiatives. In his podcast series on corruption, crime, and compliance, Mr. Volkov provides an overall plan to mitigate risks associated with conflicts of interest. He advocates for having clearly articulated policies, training, and communications, as well as solid risk assessment processes as part of your toolkit. With respect to policies and procedures in the area of conflicts of interest, he offers the following useful guidance. Now, policies and procedures, I often say that um, unlike most policies and procedures, which are I tend to go towards the shorter side of things um, and trying to be succinct, here I would always include some common hypotheticals. And the reason I say that is, as a theoretical matter, you can read about it, but in, ter- but in terms of employees really understanding it, to me, the common hypotheticals that come up in your company, if you include those within the policy so that if people do read it, they read those hypotheticals. Obviously, those would be part of any training program as well, but it's good, in my sense, is it's good to have certain hypotheticals about that. So notice how Volkov encourages us to include common hypotheticals, as he calls them, in our communication around policies and procedures. He goes on to provide examples of what these hypothetical examples might include. And you address the specific risk areas, working for business partners or competitors, family members of the company who are in the industry, personal use of company property for, let's say, an outside business interest, Uh, corporate opportunities, uh, board membership outside, financial interests, which may impact uh, this as your your employees as well. So I like the policies and procedures to be relatively short, but I also want it to uh, include some of those hypotheticals. So with respect to these hypotheticals, he's giving examples of where the risk areas might be for an organization, where conflicts of interest should be disclosed and addressed. And as Volkov points out, these need to be relevant for your own organization, so not a cookie-cutter approach. For conflicts of interest that we don't manage to avoid, we need to make sure we recognize them as they arise, and then take some form of action. In terms of the identification step, again, you start by thinking about who you owe a duty to. And as we mentioned earlier, these obligations are rooted in the laws of your jurisdiction, in the contracts you sign, and in the code of professional conduct that you're bound by professionally. Remember, too, that duties may be owed to more than one party at the same time. So you'll need to consider whose duty takes precedence, particularly if this is defined in law. Next, determine what is in the best interest of those to whom you owe a duty. Be objective here. And if it's not obvious, ask them, or confidentially speak to someone within the profession, such as a confidential member advisor, or to a lawyer. And remember that you're looking for legitimate interests here. If you're an accountant, then just because your client thinks that it's in their best interest to save tax dollars by including that family trip to Fiji as a business expense, that doesn't mean that you should play along. Your duty to act in the public interest and to follow professional standards supersedes your contractual responsibility to perform activities for any given client. Next comes the tough part, 
Think about what your self-interest is in the situation. It's a tough part because it requires objectivity, which means that we need to be self-aware and ensure that bias isn't creeping in. If we can honestly and accurately determine our own self-interest, then we'll be able to tell if there's a real conflict. But remember that the existence of a real conflict is only part of the equation. You'll need to also test whether there might be a perceived conflict, where a reasonable observer would think that a conflict exists, even though a real conflict does not. Some perceived conflicts will be easily identifiable, and you may be able to determine the perceived conflict pretty easily. Other times, they're not obvious. It's important to consider that they're based on someone else's read of the situation, and not yours. So by their very nature, they're harder for you to identify. Before you wave away the idea of a perceived conflict existing, ask someone you know to have good judgment, who's entirely objective, and see what they think. Pick someone that you know who's comfortable challenging you and voicing opinions that you may not like to hear so that you know that you're getting a candid answer. Naturally, you'll need to ensure that you don't cross any confidentiality bounds when discussing with this person, so choose carefully. Once again, your professional body or your organization may have a confidential advisor for just this purpose. Okay, so let's try this out with an example. Here's a scenario. Imagine that you are a fairly senior level professional employee in a consulting firm, and the firm is starting to pursue offering consulting services in artificial intelligence enabled risk assessment. The company is looking to recruit some data scientists and programmers to be part of the new line of business that's expected to offer lots of growth potential. Now imagine also that your nephew is an AI developer and has applied for the job. And just to make it more interesting, let's assume that your nephew has been working in India for the past year and is really hoping to move back home because your sister, his mom, has been ill and could really use his support. Oh, hey, Liz. Could you do me a favor? Sure. You know, we've got the first round of interviews for our AI risk assessment specialist starting tomorrow. And with this being such a new area for our company, I want to make sure we get the questions right. Now, I know you're not part of the selection team and it's not your department, but you've worked on a lot of these technical projects before. Mm -hmm. Would you mind taking a quick look at the resumes and see if there are any specific questions you would ask? I've removed the candidate names for privacy, as usual. Sure. I'll take a look and let you know if anything comes to mind question-wise. Great. Thank you. I'll send them your way. All right. I better look over those resumes. A glass of wine will get me through this. Honey, I've got some resumes to look over. Should take me about an hour? Hmm. AI risk assessment specialist. This is going to be an interesting ad for the company. Never had one of these before. Let's see what we've got. Hmm. Originally from here, studied at University of Montreal and UC Berkeley. Hmm, impressive. Has been working in Delhi for the past year, played on the university men's basketball team. Ah, uh, this sounds like my nephew, Reese. Hmm, cover letter. I'm applying, yada, yada, yada. Have been working in India for a year, but moving back because my mom has been ill and needs me to live closer. <laughs> yep, I'm sure this is Reese. So are you in a conflict of interest? Let's walk through the steps. So first off, think about who you owe a duty to. Well, you're a senior level employee of the company, so you'd have a duty to act in the company's best interest. You're also a professional, so there are the duties to act in the public interest, as well as the specific responsibilities around conflicts of interest that are laid out in your code of ethics. Let's focus on the company's interest in this case, because it's arguably the more interesting one to consider. The company's interest would seem to be to hire talented staff that can help them provide the best service that they can to their clients. And what's in your self-interest? Well, that will depend a bit on the relationship that you have with your nephew and his mum, your ailing sister, of course. Assuming that you're all one happy family, you'd likely want to see him get that job so that he can be closer to your sister as well as getting a great opportunity for career advancement. Let's assume that this is the case because it seems pretty reasonable. So given the fact pattern, are these interests, the company's and your own, 
Are these interests in conflict? Well, maybe or maybe not. If your nephew is an excellent candidate for the job, if he's really talented and would be a great ad for the company, then your interests and the company's interests are, in fact, well aligned. In that case, there would be no real conflict. Or looking at it from another angle, what if you have absolutely no influence over hiring decisions? Maybe it's a really large company and the entire hiring process is done centrally through national headquarters. If you can't impact the decision, then again, there's no real conflict. But there may still be the perception of a conflict. A reasonable person could think that you'd be motivated to get him hired, and perhaps even influential in doing so, even if he wasn't a strongly qualified candidate. And that's why nepotism can be such a challenging issue. We know that children often get opportunities because of their family connections. And it's hard to assess when they're deserving of the opportunities and when they're just getting hired because their family member was self-interested and exerted some form of influence or pressure. For those of you who watch the television sitcom The Office, you may recall the episode where the boss, Michael, hired his nephew. And another thing I did this summer, I hired my nephew. The nephew turned out to be less than ideal as an employee, but Michael explained to the staff, He should not be punished because he is related to me and bad at what he does. In true Michael form, he implored his staff, Guys, look, I don't want you to treat him like anyone else in the office. I just want you to treat him like my nephew. Some of us have certainly seen examples of nepotism in action with bad outcomes, so naturally we're skeptical. And we might easily perceive that the hiring of a family member is a conflict of interest that was mishandled. But returning to the example of your nephew being hired by your employer, could you have avoided this conflict of interest? Maybe, depending on, for example, whether he shared his career aspirations about applying to your company before or after he submitted his CV. But on the other hand, perhaps this isn't an example of a potential conflict that should be avoided. If your nephew is in fact very qualified, and especially if his skill set is in high demand and hard to find, then trying to dissuade him from applying might actually make the company worse off. Now, this doesn't mean that you're off the hook with respect to taking some mitigating action regarding the potential perceived conflict, but we'll get to that in the next section when we look at evaluating and addressing conflicts of interest. So we'll be back with that in the next module. Welcome back. In this final module, we're going to pick up where we left off in the example where you're a professional employee in a consulting firm and your nephew has just applied for an AI job at the company. In the previous module, we identified the real and perceived conflict of interest, and now we need to evaluate how serious these are. The end goal of this assessment is to figure out whether the threats related to the competing interests can be mitigated and reduced to an acceptable level by putting safeguards in place, or whether the conflict simply needs to be eliminated altogether. To evaluate how serious the conflict of interest is, you can use the risk matrix approach that you're most likely already familiar with from a different context. What we mean by that is evaluating the situation in terms of both the impact of a potential outcome and the probability of it occurring. So we figure out how severe the negative impact could be and how likely it is to occur if we don't take steps to address it. And that helps us determine then how much work we need to do to address it. So continuing on with the same example of your nephew applying for a job at the company that you work for, we'll try using the risk matrix approach to evaluate how significant the conflict of interest is. So what is the negative outcome that could occur from this conflict of interest? Well, we said that assuming your nephew is an excellent candidate for the job and you don't have a direct influence over the hiring decision, then it's a perceived conflict, but not a real one. The negative outcome would be that 
other employees, or perhaps clients or other partners, might think that he got the job because there was favoritism, even though that was not the case. This could impact employee morale, or even lead to a negative reputation for the company. So how severe and how likely is this? The likelihood will depend on how much people know about the family relationship, and maybe on whether you'll end up working together. And the severity? Well, it's not something you want to ignore, but the company may not want to miss out on hiring a talented candidate just because of perception. In this kind of a situation, the organization would be looking for some simple steps to safeguard against the negative impacts and to manage the situation. We'll come back to some safeguards shortly. At the other end of the spectrum, if it were a real conflict, for example, if he were not qualified and you do have influence over the decision, the outcomes are much more concerning. The risk would be high that an unqualified candidate gets the job, which would obviously be a serious problem for the company in several different ways. So once you've assessed the situation, you'll need to determine whether the conflict of interest needs to be eliminated or whether it can and should be managed and mitigated. Remember that in laws and in professional codes, there are often prohibitions that explicitly require professionals to eliminate certain conflicts of interest. So, for example, auditor independence requirements that prohibit the auditor from taking on certain engagements if that self-interest threat to objectivity is too great. Or lawyers or real estate agents may be prohibited outright from representing two parties at the same time if their interests conflict. Even if there's no prohibition, your professional judgment may lead you to decide that eliminating the threat is something that's necessary. So to return to our example with your nephew and change up the facts a bit, let's say instead that you're the CEO of a public company and your nephew was applying for the CFO position. In that kind of situation, the decision might be made that there's no way that your nephew could be hired for that position, even if he is an excellent candidate for the job, because the perception of rampant nepotism may simply be too great of a risk to morale and reputation of the organization. But if the situation isn't one that's prohibited, and it's one that isn't as severe in terms of the risk of negative outcomes, the best decision, in other words, the decision that best serves the organization or person to which the duty is owed, the best decision might be to accept the conflict but to mitigate and manage it through appropriate safeguards. The first safeguard, which will almost always be appropriate, is disclosing the nature and extent of the conflicting interests to the appropriate parties. And we say almost always appropriate because we need to watch out for confidentiality concerns here. There are times when you may be bound by confidentiality agreements that limit how much you can disclose, but Appropriate transparency is key here. Getting consent makes sure that the people that are owed a duty understand the risks and the benefits, and that they're on board with your plan to mitigate those risks. Getting consent is as much for your protection as it is for the consenters, and you'll want to get it in writing to make sure that it's clear. And a bit of guidance here. If you're not sure whether something needs disclosing or not, so if you're not sure if you're in a conflict, then err on the side of caution and disclose. Again, subject to confidentiality requirements, of course. The last thing that you want is for someone else to suggest that there's a perceived conflict that might also be a real conflict regarding a situation that you were concerned about but that you didn't disclose. It's better to over-disclose than to under-disclose. This is also a good time to use the front page of the newspaper test and ask how it would look if you didn't disclose and if it ended up as a news headline. Follow your gut here. If it feels like something that should be disclosed, do so. If it's not possible to disclose the conflict due to confidentiality reasons, it's going to be considerably more challenging to effectively mitigate the situation because some key stakeholders will not be aware of its existence and will not have the opportunity to provide informed consent to permit the conflict. In that kind of situation, then you may simply need to eliminate the conflict and simply not be involved in that situation. 
you'll also need to recuse yourself from any decision-making related to the conflict of interest. So, for example, if you're on a board and you stand to benefit or a family member or friend stands to benefit from a decision being made by the board, you'd need to disclose the conflict, excuse yourself from the room for any discussions about the matter, and certainly not be present or vote on the issue. Simply not voting really isn't sufficient because your presence in the room during discussions applies social pressure on other board members with you there and can chill the otherwise open conversation. Even outside the boardroom, you'll need to make sure that you don't do anything that would be intended to influence the discussion or the vote either. But what about situations where recusal isn't possible? What if you're an employee choosing a new vendor and you're the one with the knowledge needed to make sure that the best decision is made for the organization? If your input is needed, but you're in a conflict, maybe because a family member is one of the potential vendors, in that type of situation, a common safeguard is to add a layer of independent review over the decision-making. Basically, you want to get another set of eyes, an independent set of eyes on that decision. So back to our example of your employer potentially hiring your nephew. Assuming again that your nephew is an excellent candidate for the job, then you'd need to ensure that the human resources team or whoever's running the hiring process is aware of the relationship with your nephew so that they can keep that in consideration during their evaluation. You'd also make sure that you're not otherwise involved in the hiring process or decision, of course. If your nephew does end up getting hired, the company will want to mitigate any misconceptions by ensuring that the team understands his credentials and why he's well qualified for the job. And on an ongoing basis, you wouldn't be tasked with his performance evaluation. So to summarize, our toolkit for mitigating and managing conflicts of interest includes disclosure to the appropriate people and ongoing transparency of information to the extent that's allowed while respecting confidentiality obligations, recusal from decision-making wherever possible, segregating duties in order to get appropriate independent oversight over decisions and judgments, and written consent from those who the duty is owed to. And just like with any system, you'll need to monitor the effectiveness and the safeguards that you've put in place to ensure that they're working, and make adjustments if they're not or if the situation changes. If the mitigation plan isn't working, you probably need to eliminate the conflict of interest outright. Okay, so we've spent the last while talking about the dangers of conflict of interest, but let's return to the idea that conflicts of interest are normal and that they happen quite regularly in a wide range of roles. Here's an example from MSNBC host Chris Hayes from a conversation that he had with author Kianga Yamada-Taylor about U.S. housing policies over the decades. Even now, like, so I, I have a mortgage on a home in New York. We own a home in Brooklyn, right? Yeah. We're very lucky to be able to afford that. And I even now, I will see reporting in the paper, and this has actually been the case in the last few years, that home values in New York are down. The public policy part of me is like, Good. Right, the, right. It's too expensive to live in New York. Right. We need housing to come down. We, I would love for it to drop year over right. year for several years in a row so that more. But the homeowner part of me is like, oh, that's not great. In his role as a media spokesperson, Hayes believes that he has a moral and professional obligation to support public policy that is in the interest of society. But of course, as a member of that same public, he has a personal interest in the effects that are brought about by policy decisions. Now, Chris Hayes is well removed from the actual policy-making decisions. He's not the one setting economic policy or tax law or what have you. But think about this. Every one of the people who are, in fact, responsible for those decisions, in other words, the politicians and the public officials who do set laws and policies, every one of those people are potentially impacted by the policies they set. So there are inherent conflicts of interest that need to be appropriately managed. So again, conflicts of interest are a normal part of our world that we need to manage through, for example, transparency of decision-making and independent oversight. And we'd even go so far as to say that sometimes conflicts of interest can be a good thing, or at least can be indicative of a good thing. For example, let's say that you've got a volunteer board member serving on an organization's board, and that board member has specific expertise that the organization really needs on a particular project. 
let's assume that the project is something bigger than would reasonably be expected for a volunteer to do, something that takes more time than what a reasonable volunteer commitment would be. So at that point, the organization has a couple of options. They could go out to market and find someone completely separate from the board to take on that project that needs to be done. So they could hire an expert that's external to the organization, external to the board. That's their first option. But what happens if the field of expertise is more specific and there's really not that many people who have that expertise? And those who have the necessary skills and experience don't really know the organization that well and consequently would need to be trained up in terms of how the organization functions. In that situation, isn't it valid to say that it's in the organization's best interest to be able to hire the board member to do that work? In that kind of situation, a conflict of interest has come up based on the fact that the board member may be getting a benefit that could be deemed to be a result of their board position. But if we look a little bit deeper into it, remember that the board's function, the board's duty, is to act in the organization's best interest. And if it's the case that the organization is best served by having that specific expertise, then perhaps what we need to do is to find a way to make it okay that the organization gets the best expert for the job and that the expert is compensated fairly. So there we've got a conflict of interest that came out of a good thing. A board member who has lots of expertise that the organization needs and who is engaged with that organization in a way to help their organization succeed. And those who teach governance will tell you, or at least should tell you, that those kinds of conflicts of interest coming up are actually a very strong sign. It's a sign that the board is varied in its skill set and has the right skills on board. And for professionals, finding yourself in a potential conflict of interest situation is often a sign that your expertise is valued and that you're engaged in your community. People with strong networks and lots of expertise and lots of connections are more likely to run into conflicts of interest. The key is to appropriately manage them, starting with recognizing that there's a potential conflict and then appropriately disclosing it. We also know that we want diversity on our boards and in our organizations. And the more diverse the organization is, and therefore the more diverse the individuals are and the more skilled they are, again, the more likely it is that we're going to run into some situations where a conflict of interest comes up. The real key is to manage and control the situations when they do arise and ensure that appropriate outcomes result. And to do this, we need to be diligent with both identifying real and perceived conflicts, ensure full transparency around the process and the decision-making, and make sure that the right people are informed and can give consent to the situation and whatever mitigation has been put in place, such as drawing on independent oversight as needed. Deanne Jules, the IESBA's deputy director, put it this way. Professionals have expertise and skills that extend beyond the boundaries of the particular organization where they work. They also tend to be well-connected and have large networks. That means they are sometimes asked to be involved in a number of different initiatives where conflicts of interest can arise. When someone finds themselves where there is a conflict of interest, they haven't automatically done something wrong. It's really how they react to it. So the bottom line is that conflicts of interest can't always be avoided. And just because we find ourselves in one, that doesn't mean that we've acted unprofessionally. But at the same time, we need to remember that conflicts of interest are an important area for professionals because they can have serious repercussions for us and for our organizations if we don't deal with them appropriately. It's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we're diligent in recognizing and addressing real and perceived conflicts of interest and that we help our clients and the organizations that rely on us to do the same. We hope you enjoyed this course and found some useful ideas. This wraps up the course. There's a quick quiz now for you to complete if you'd like a certificate for the course. Thanks for listening and bye for now.